Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. And welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh. <laughs> There's Chuck. Ben's here sitting in for Jerry. It's Ben H. Week in the producer's chair. And this is Stuff You Should Know. Uh, I got a slide whistle in my Christmas stocking. You realize you got me this slide whistle. I know, but I got my own now. Oh, okay. I thought we were talking about me. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, are you? I guess you're still enjoying it. You brought it out. Yes. Yeah, I love it. What'd you use it for with peanuts? I just thought it kind of fit the motif a little bit. Comics, you know? So sure. I've been looking for an opportunity to bust it out, and here we go. I thought you, because not everyone knows this, uh, and this almost never happens, we started to record... Josh said, hold on a second, and left. And I was pretty convinced you were going to come back with a trombone and a plunger. That was close. <laughs> that was close, man. That would have been something. Now I suddenly am ashamed of my slide whistle. Wah, 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 wah. Exactly. That was a pretty good one. Thanks. Hey, while we're on that, Chuck, what you're talking about is the adults in the Peanuts universe. Mm-hmm. You never see them. You saw them once, um, and it was just strange. Uh, it, you can hear them off of off camera, and they're discussed and talked about. You just don't see them. But in the specials, when they talk, mm-hmm. they talk like that, and it's a muted trombone, like you said, a plunger and a trombone. Mm-hmm. And um, that was the idea of Vince Giraldi, who was the guy who created the soundtrack for the Peanuts Christmas special. Dang straight. One of the, I think it's a number two best-selling jazz record of all time, right? Yeah, after Miles Davis is kind of blue. Of course. Yeah. Is it Giraldi? I thought it was Giraldi. Is it Giraldi? I think it's kind of like that whole gif-jif argument. (laughs) The only person who can say is Vince Giraldi. I was about to say his family's like, "Mm, it's not like that at all. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So we're talking today about peanuts, in case you didn't know. It's funny, I was researching peanuts and I came across at least a couple uh, results that were actually about peanuts, the food. It was a little Mm -hmm. confusing for a second, but for the most part, There's a lot of really interesting stuff out there that people have written about peanuts. Uh, And I think the reason why is because it's it's really cerebral, like surprisingly, disarmingly cerebral. Um, And people have gotten so much out of it over the five decades that it was around or or more than that by now, almost 75 years since it started, um, that everyone just kind of loves it and has some sort of emotional connection to it. So there's been a lot of, like, good written analysis about it, essays yeah. and odes and stuff like that. Totally. And, you know, one thing that I'm sure you can verify, speaking for both of us, researching peanuts is a hard thing to stop doing. <laughs> it really is. You can just – it's just one of these topics. You can just keep going and going and going because it's all interesting. Beyond the nostalgic love, it's interesting as an adult – to look back on some of this stuff. Yeah. Uh, because it's really has, you know, the way it's framed in my mind, at least, is a lot different now than it was when I was a kid. Um, yeah. It just a, a, a landmark comic strip in, in every single way. One of, if not the biggest and best ever. Yeah, it's it's a very deceptive comic in that all of the characters are kids, um, grade school kids. Um, but it's not a kid's comic. It's a comic for adults. And yeah. I remember being a kid and, like, the extent that I appreciated it was, you know, Charlie Brown flying through the air or Lucy calling somebody a blockhead or Snoopy doing his thing. That was it. I didn't get any of the the existentialism associated yeah. with it. Nothing like that. It was totally lost to <laughs> me. And I think that's the way it was meant to be. You know, sometimes people can, can create works, like The Simpsons are a good idea or a uh-huh. good uh, example, where, like, it can be enjoyed on multiple levels. Um and that's true of Peanuts, too, but the proportions are off. It's not even. Like, the adult enjoyment of Peanuts is far greater and deeper than the kids' appreciation of Peanuts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I think it's definitely for kids. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think it's just the proportions are off. Yeah, that's what I said. I know, but at the beginning you said it's not a, a comic for kids. It's for adults, and I, I disagree. I think it's for kids, too. Uh, but I think adults can definitely gain more insight. You know what I have to say that? What? Peanuts? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you mentioned that Peanuts ran for almost 50 years. You said five decades, and mm-hmm. I know math. 
Uh, it ran from October 2nd, 1950 to February 13, 2000. Yeah. And for uh, almost all of that, that five decades, uh, one Charles Schultz drew seven Peanuts comics a week. Uh, I think the, the Sunday started in 1952 for 17,897 comic strips. And he didn't farm these out. No. He, he did them himself, and he— uh, you found that one thing that was like he he also generally did them in pen as well uh, because he was just so sort of decisive in his work. Yeah. Um, I saw somebody say like the average comic artist couldn't w- would have trouble keeping up that level of dedication for a decade, let alone five. Yeah. Like the, just the amount of um, dedication it takes to do that. Like a- apparently Charles Schultz was completely cut out for that kind of thing. Um, he wasn't a big fan of holidays because they got in the way of his work. Like, that's what he was dedicated to. I saw one of his family members, either a widow, ex-wife, or a child, I can't remember, who said, like, oh, I think it was his, one of his daughters, who said, like, his family was not his everything. The, the Peanuts comic strip was his everything. That was his life. Yeah. And, and he built a life for himself and for his family outside of that. But, I mean, like, that's what that guy's purpose on Earth was, and he fulfilled it to the nines. Yeah. I mean, one thing I can relate to, I think, both of us a little bit is doing something with consistency over a great deal of time. Mm -hmm. We're in year 16. Right. (laughs) Can you imagine 50 years? No, I really can't. But we've said stuff like this before, so (laughs) it's entirely possible we'll end up in year 50. I um, I won't be around, my friend. That's not true. There's going to be all sorts of great breakthroughs in in uh, medicine in the next decade or two. If I'm a ninety something year old podcaster, then something went horribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a glitch in the matrix, huh? Yeah, exactly. So one of the things about peanuts is that um, it's universally loved because it was basically available throughout the universe. Yeah. Um, Twenty six hundred newspapers is at its peak, and it was at a peak pretty much from the 70s onward, um, 2,600 newspapers in 75 countries in 21 different languages, and its readership was about 350 million people around the world. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why it was so um, so widespread is because the thing about Peanuts, from all the research I did and just kind of coming to understand what the whole thing was about— is that it's about the universal human condition. It's not just about Americans and mm-hmm. what Americans go through. It's not just about um, Canadians even and what Canadians go through. It's <laughs> about what every human alive goes through. It's very basic human condition stuff is what they're actually talking about and what are behind a lot of the gags. And so um, that, that to me is, is pretty much the explanation right there for why it's so universally loved. Yeah, and the human condition thing, uh, generally with Peanuts, wasn't the thrill of victory, but the agony of defeat. Yeah. Uh, Time and time again, these characters suffer setbacks and failures over and over and over. And even when they're not doing that, there are very few grand victories at all. And it's, it's amazing to look at it now that it was, I mean, I guess people do connect with that, but it's amazing to look at a comic strip in the funny papers about these kids with such pathos and with such failure Mm -hmm. and such, you know, some sometimes clearly depression. It's just, it's really, uh, is a remarkable cultural, um, staple, I think. Yeah. And it's much easier to, to think of now because it's so widespread among comics, but at the time in 1950, yeah, this was, there was nothing like it. I mean, there had been some stuff about little kids and kid groups that, like comics that had focused on that, some of which inspired Charles Schultz. But this, it was just groundbreaking in every single way. Yeah, totally. Um, So should we go to the man himself? Yeah, let's. All right. So Charles M. Schultz uh, was born in November uh, 26, 1922 in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, He got the nickname Sparky when he was a kid, well, when he was a baby, in fact, because his uncle uh, saw him and thought that he looked like uh, this character from another cartoon uh, called Barney Google named Sparky. So he nicknamed him Spartplug. That became Sparky. And apparently everyone who knew him and was close to him in his life called him Sparky for his whole life. Yeah. 
Um, and apparently he always wanted to draw comics, even from a young age. It was his aspiration that he got to fulfill. So cool. And then some. But his dad, Carl, was a barber. Um, and he was, I think, a German immigrant. His mother, Dina, was a Norwegian immigrant. So Charles was a full first-generation American kid. Um, and he and his dad loved to read the funny papers together. Um so that was just kind of like his training came from just enjoying it with his father, which is pretty neat. And then his mother also, and this is fairly rare among um, Western European or Northern European immigrant families, his mother encouraged his drawing too. It wasn't yeah. looked at as just some dumb idle thing that was a waste of time. Like he he, he was encouraged to follow his, his, um, his destiny, I guess. Yeah. I thought you – I was hanging there. I was wondering what it was going to be. Dream. Destiny's perfect. You don't know have to say of that? <laughs> Slide whistle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he was drawing, like you said, he was he wanted to be a cartoonist from a very young age. So he was drawing from a very young age. Uh, he got published for the first time when he was 14, mm -hmm. which is remarkable, yeah. in a, a newspaper comic, in a Ripley's Believe It or Not comic. That's awesome. Uh, and it was an image of Spike, the family dog. Uh, not that Spike. We're going to get to Spike later, one of my favorite characters in the Peanuts canon. Oh, yeah? You like that uh, stash? <laughs> I love Spike. <laughs> he was a desert hippie, you know? Yeah, he totally was, wasn't he? He was the best. Uh, but Spike was their family dog. Um, it was signed, uh, drawn by Sparky. So that was like his first little cartoon signature was Sparky. Mm -hmm. And Spike was a pointer. Uh, not a beagle. This wasn't Snoopy yet, but it was the inspiration for Snoopy. I believe Spike was black and white, mm -hmm. but was a pointer. Yeah. So we've got, like, this is a really good example of what Charles Schultz did. He drew from his life, sometimes drew people's names mm -hmm. um, for the characters that he introduced. Um, sometimes he would base characters and, like, their looks or their demeanor on people he knew. And And so Spike, or Snoopy being based on Spike is, like, Pretty much par for the course for what he yeah. did. And um, so, 14, he gets his first cartoon published in Ripley's Believe It or Not, Believe It or Not, like you said. Um, and then in, as a senior in high school, he took a correspondence drawing class from what was originally called the Federal School of Applied Cartooning, a division of the Bureau of Engraving, which happened to be located in Minneapolis, where he lived, essentially. And that later went on to become Art Instruction Schools, Inc., and for those Still not great name wise, no, but <laughs> I know for a fact that you're familiar with this because you were a kid growing up in the late seventies and eighties. Oh, I know it's coming. And those TV <laughs> ads, do you remember? Oh, well, I remember ads in magazines and comic books. I okay. don't remember the TV ads. You're slightly older, so my my age group had the TV ads. We didn't have the picture box. This was <laughs> this was um, what you're talking about. Were like magazine ads that had. Tippy the Turtle, Tiny the Mouse, or Pirate. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And you, you could choose which one to draw, and you sent it in, and maybe you won a prize. But really, what you were doing was inadvertently um, sending your information to art instruction schools who would try to recruit you for their art correspondence course. And this is in the 80s. I think they, they were still going into, like, two, the 2010s, essentially. Oh, wow, really? But that's where Charles Schultz received his initial training. Uh, and the cost for that was about $3,800 in today's um, money. And don't forget, like, his dad's a barber. Like, barbers have yeah. never been particularly rich. Um, so it was like a, a big deal that his parents were helping him out with this this uh, this um, correspondence course fee so that he could go get formal training as a, a cartoonist. Totally. Um, he graduated from there, saw it all the way through, uh, went to work doing some various jobs here and there. He was... You know, drawing cartoons, drawing comics, submitting them everywhere he could. Mm -hmm. uh, as, you know, uh, many stories like this goes, he was rejected by everybody, basically. Uh, the night before he ships off for World, uh, World War II, his mother, Dina, passes away uh, from cervical cancer. And this was a real sort of lifelong scar for him. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, some people say that, you know, sort of the pathos and the deep loneliness that all the Peanuts gang felt was... Um, sort of him getting this out. And as we'll see, you know, everybody from his wife to people that have studied him have confirmed, and even Charles Schultz himself, that mm -hmm. like each of these characters is a, is a little piece of him in some way. Right. 
Um, so yeah, he was he had to grapple with like a basically a one two punch of trauma because um, after his mom's death, like, and he shipped out, he saw combat. Mm-hmm. He was in combat, so he's dealing with combat while he's also, you know, dealing with the grief from the loss of his mom. Um, yeah, so that's I mean that's gonna have a pretty big impact on anybody, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, he makes it through the war, though, obviously. Uh, goes back to Minneapolis, goes back to the art school mm-hmm. that he graduated from and got a job there. Uh, so he was an instructor there. And for about five years, he was uh, still drawing, still, I guess, uh, t- looking at pictures of uh, pirates and, and turtles and things. Mm-hmm. And he was, you know, he was getting his own style together. He was learning about comics and how it all worked and the business side of things. Right. And you said he often named people after people in his real life. Um, three of his colleagues there was one, Charles Brown, mm-hmm. uh, a Linus Marrer, and Frida Rich. Yeah, Frida was a, a minor character with curly red hair, but she wasn't the red-haired girl that Charlie Brown had a, a no. endless crush on. That was based on another person, a, a woman named Donna Johnson, who Charles Schultz dated when they both worked at the art instruction school. Um, and she turned him down, and he forever, I guess, kind of pined or kept a flame or something for her. Um, at the very least, she she became the red-haired girl that Charlie Brown could never have. Can you imagine being the inspiration for one of these characters? I know. It's pretty cool. The guy was like the Taylor Swift of his era. <laughs> hey, she's got eras. And then also a little-known fact. Um, that was a good one, by the way. Uh, Donna Johnson, who turned down Charles Schultz and inspired the red-haired girl, uh, went on to marry instead a firefighter named Al Wald. And Al Wald turned out to be the basis of the character Gargamel in Peo's Smurfs cartoon. Amazing. So in 1947, he got his first uh, big sort of career break. Uh, when he had his cartoon Lil Folks, L-I apostrophe L, mm-hmm. which is a weekly comic. Uh, he got it in the St. Paul Pioneer Press. And then uh, when he was 27 in 1950, he got a syndication deal for Lil Folks in seven newspapers. <laughs> not not a hundred. Yeah. Uh, and they had to change the name. There was already a Little Folks, and there was also Lil Abner. Mm-hmm. And so they said, you know, we can't really do this. We got to change it. So they changed the name to Peanuts, mm-hmm. uh, reference to Howdy Duties, Peanut Gallery, and Schultz evidently never liked that name, even though it's hard to imagine anything different now. Oh, no way. Plus, also, he's like, Peanuts is too schmaltzy and saccharine. Give me little folks any day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But yeah. yeah, he carried that around the whole the whole career. He hated the name Peanuts. He never came to like it. Uh, which is bizarre. Um, and then I, I guess with that syndication deal, um, one of the really big things that happened was he moved from this um, space filler um, section on like the women's page in the St. Paul Pioneer Press to the comics page in addition to getting like a huge bump in pay. So now he'd made it as a comic. His comic was now on the comics page, which was a huge deal to him. Yeah, huge bump in pay. So he he went to like thirty dollars a week. <laughs> yeah, he had, he had been making ten, and the editor of um, the St. Paul Pioneer Press was like, "I'm not giving you a dime more than that." So uh, the first Peanuts comic strip uh, came on October second, nineteen fifty, and I think that is a pretty good place for our first break, eh? I think so. All right, we'll be right back. <laughs> All right, so the first Peanuts is October 2nd, 1950. Uh, Snoopy the dog appeared just two days later on October 4th, 1950. It was for Snoopy's first appearance. Uh, Snoopy on four legs. I don't think uh, if you're not, you know, a, a big Peanuts aficionado, you might not know that Snoopy started out much more dog-like. And Charlie Brown would teach Snoopy to walk on two legs. And Snoopy's character really, more than any other character uh, the, in Peanuts, changed over those 50 years. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, even though a lot of them changed quite a bit because 
you know, like with anything, with any, even television sitcom, like the characters really grow, like you cast um, your cast, whether it's TV or it's a cartoon mm-hmm. or a graphic novel. Mm-hmm. And then as you write, they become real and they change and evolve just like real people. And that's certainly what happened to Peanuts. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Um, one of the other things about that's widely recognized about Peanuts is the the style of the drawing, of the writing, of, of the lettering, all that stuff. It's just immediately recognizable as Peanuts. And um, Schultz's style was described as a formal minimalism. Mm-hmm. And he had the four-panel um, uh, format, I guess, foisted on him at first. Wow, there's a lot of Fs. Alliteration. Um, and he had to work within it. And a lot of times, just being constrained by rules can actually produce the best art, you know? Um, sometimes when you don't have any rules, it's tough to to find your way or your direction or where you're starting. Starting in a structure can help a lot. And he really thrived in that, even though he apparently didn't like um, having that foisted on him. But this minimal style um, and the the proportions between the the lettering, the di- like the 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 speech bubbles and the kids and the panels, there was a study that called it Schultzian symmetry, which makes a lot of sense. And that what Charles Schultz did first was draw the panels, then he wrote the dialogue, then he drew the characters. And there's a writer named Ivan Brutelli who wrote in the Paris Review that pointed out, um, like, if you if you look at a Peanuts cartoon, you're on, like, eye level with them. You're not looking up, you're not looking down. You are on their level, and in in that way, it draws you into the cartoon, and you can imagine yourself, like, in there with them. It, it makes it that much more, it, like, it makes you part of that world and vice versa. Yeah, that's the one thing I didn't get, because that's, isn't that every comic in the world? Uh, so, before him, yes, now, before him, that was they, not like, the style. Have- did they draw like they were looking down on top of someone's head? They did whatever they wanted. <laughs> and each one was giant and took up huge amounts of the newspaper. And they were masterpieces. Like they were works of art. Um, oftentimes a lot, really surreal. They were all over the place. All sorts of different perspectives. This was new. And it was part of that formal minimalism that it was this one. You looked at it the one way from the side at the in these these. Specific proportions. It was it was it, something new that he introduced. Uh, a little while ago, when you were saying that those constraints can really lead to great things, mm-hmm. I thought you were going to say, "Unless it's Family Circus." <laughs> oh, do you not like Family Circus? <laughs> when was the last time you looked at Family Circus? Let's see, age seven. Okay, <laughs> it was terrible. Oh, I mean, I loved that family because I was a little kid that read the comics. Yeah, like incessantly me too but like humor in a family circus con uh pan it was just a single square was like you know jeffy tripped over the book <laughs> poor jeff that's ha, classic ha, ha. jeffy <laughs> uh the other good thing about <laughs> getting peanuts going uh was that it was known and marketed as a space saving comic uh-huh. so those four panels could be arranged however you wanted if you wanted to draw a square you could if you wanted them up and down you could uh, so that was, you know, a real benefit to a newspaper who were, um, when you do newspaper layout, is a big part of putting together a newspaper, mm-hmm. making everything fit on the page. Mm-hmm. So that was that was a big plus for him is having that flexibility. I imagine Family Circus, even more flexible. <laughs> sure. Just the one square. Right. Uh, but because of this minimalism, it, it really, the character is what shown because it wasn't like, look at this outstanding art. It's art we grew to love. Right. But it was look at these characters and look at these emotions that these characters are feeling and how they're insecure and they're frustrated right. and they're sad. But that's also coupled with the fact that they were also very smart at times. They were uh, it could be very funny, but a lot of times it wasn't funny at all. As far as just like, you know, an LOL type of funny, it was something meaningful. Right. But there was always a lot of hope, I think. And, you know, Dave helped put this together and he points out which a gazillion other people have pointed out that no matter how many times Lucy holds that football, Charlie's going to try and kick it. And it's not because he's dumb. No. And that's, I mean, that's part of a gag, right? That he, he, um, she's going to pull the football away at the last moment. He's going to go flying through the air. 
But the bigger part of the gag is that he's going to keep trying, and you know that she's not going to let him kick that football, and yet he's going to keep trying and trying, you know? Like, that's the dual level that that Peanuts exists on. It's a good example of that. Who was the... uh... When when he when Peanuts turned 100, there were some of the most major comics did tributes, mm, man. and you sent along some of those. Yeah. Was that Mark Trail who let him kick the football? Close. Who was it? It was Gil Thorpe. Uh, I didn't know Gil Thorpe. So if you want to, I actually, I tears were were brought to my eyes. I'm not gonna. No, lie. I was crying. The if you want to just feel incredibly moved. Wait until the end of this episode and then go look up the November 22nd, 2022 comic strip of Gil Thorpe and you will be moved. It's amazing. All the tributes were amazing. Yeah. And it, and it was so cool to see Snoopy and a Garfield and yeah. High and Lois, even though I didn't like them, go in for marriage counseling with Lucy. Like, oh, yeah. It, it's, it was a, a surreal, like, amazing tribute mashup and uh, pretty wonderful thing. Yeah, it was part of this um, this drive for basically every comic artist um, working at the time to bas- to to create a tribute comic on November twenty sixth, twenty twenty two, which was like you said, Charles Schultz's hundredth birthday, or it would have been had he, had he lived to a hundred. Family Circus didn't do it. They did. No, they said Jeffy's got to uh, flush his pencil down the toilet instead. No, they did something. <laughs> I don't remember, but it wasn't like. It wasn't dead on. It was a little off now that you mention it. Although, so Family Circus has one of the sweetest single panel comics I've ever seen in my life, though. I saw years ago when it All when right. it came out. And Let's still to this day, I think it's one of the sweetest things ever. It's Did little, Jeffy step in the mud? No, Jeffy wasn't even in the panel. <laughs> so you would have loved it. You know, Jeff does the Family Circus now. Oh, is he the real son? Yeah. I feel terrible. Yeah, you should. This is going to get listening. to him. He's a huge stuff you should know <laughs> fan. Um, so little PJ, the baby, yeah, is coming up. He's got his blanket with him. He's in his maybe little PJs or whatever. Huge smile on his face, and he's just gotten up from a nap. And it says the caption is, here comes sunshine. I love it. See, I, I, I take it all back. Family Circus, I loved it. It was wonderful. It was wholesome. Uh, but as a kid who's into comedy, it didn't deliver the laughs that I needed. Sure. <laughs> I'm trying to think of, for me, The Far Side was the first comic that I ever, like, genuinely laughed at. Oh, see, that didn't come along until I was older, so. Yeah, same here. I mean, like, it was the mid-80s, yeah. so I was easily 10 at least. And I'd just been sitting there dourly reading comics up to that point. Oh, see, I was... I, got, I was laughing at all that stuff. I Neil really Bailey don't. And, yeah, I loved yeah. all of them. Like you said, High and Lois, Hagar the Horrible, all those. Mm-hmm. I don't think any of them ever made me laugh until Farside came along. All right. So Wait, no. I want to talk more about that and that phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it didn't take long for Peanuts to become a really big deal. Um, just five years in, when he was 33 years old, Peanuts, oh, I'm sorry, Schultz was named Cartoonist of the Year. Yeah, that's huge. So. That's only five years in. And then uh, 10 years after that, uh, Peanuts was on the cover of Time magazine. It's pretty big, too. Huge, huge th- uh, deal. Um, I already mentioned sort of like, you know, you're sort of like casting a play or, or a TV show. But Charles Schultz actually talked about that, um, that writing a comic is like casting a drama company mm-hmm. and that these characters do grow and and change over time. And before he knew it. Um, humor started coming out of their little mouths. And it was he was almost like a conduit, it feels like. Yeah, he definitely was. And what's remarkable, though, is over 50 years, he never seemed to have gotten all of it out. Because uh, I think you said earlier, people widely consider the Peanuts characters to all be parts of Charles Schultz's psyche, essentially. Mm-hmm. Art Spiegelman, the guy who created Mouse, said that Peanuts was Schultz breaking himself up into child-sized pieces and letting them go at each other for half a century. Yeah, and his widow Jeannie said that um, specific characters were were meaningful to, to Schultz himself, as far as the psyche was concerned. He said that Charlie Brown is his wishy washy and insecure side. Lucy's a smart Alex side, which he enjoyed having, because um, apparently he wasn't particularly good at getting that out in person. Linus, curious and thoughtful side, and then Snoopy. This is important to me. Snoopy is the way I would like to be: fearless, the life of the party. And brushing off Lucy's bad temper with a glancing kiss. 
And don't you think it's telling that he made the character that he aspires to be the most the dog? Telling in what sense? I think it just says a lot about him that, like, at the very least, he thought highly of dogs. Oh, he loved his dogs. Right. And I think that it's pretty difficult to dislike anybody who loves dogs like that. You know, that Garfield guy hates cats. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he loathes them. I collected those books, too. Actually, the, well, now that I think about it, the first one that really, not the first one that made me laugh, but the first one that hit me on an, a second level was uh, Bloom County. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was huge into Garfield and Bloom County. I loved Garfield. I had those books, too. They were world class. The colors, yeah. too, in Garfield comics are really great. I still got a cat that eats lasagna. I still got all those Bloom County books, too. Those, those hold up. Oh, yeah? You, you, are you bequeathing them to Ruby? Uh, boy, I mean, she she won't get them now. That was for no, no. I mean, almost eventually. for adults. Oh, sure, she'll get everything. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, but I want to like show her at some point when she's like twelve. You're like, hey, you should check out Bloom County. There's a penguin who's friends with a uh, crazy street cat. <laughs> she's gonna be like. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about I, some I of these. I promise main... everybody that's the last time I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, we'll get emails that people like more slide whistle. <laughs> I'll bet. Uh, let's talk about some of these main characters. Obviously, we can't hit them all because there were uh, more than 70 characters throughout Peanuts. Uh, but we're going to hit the biggies, of course, starting with Charlie Brown mm -hmm. and that iconic shirt. Uh, that was another sort of thing with Peanuts is that um, they would change clothes sometimes. Oh, yeah. But, like, Charlie Brown had that shirt on almost all the time. Lucy wore that blue dress mm -hmm. for decades yeah. until they phased out the dress in the 80s and then completely stopped putting her in dresses in the 90s. Oh, really? What does she wear? I haven't noticed. Just pants and a shirt. Culottes. Like, I think they they changed with the time a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, why put a 90s, 2000s Lucy in a little, like, 1950s girly dress? Gotcha. Um, at least, you know, full time. Uh, but Schultz said that Charlie Brown of Charlie Brown, we all know what it's like to lose, but Charlie Brown kept losing outrageously. It's not that he's a loser. He's really a decent little sort. So I think that's a, a big point. Like Charlie Brown is constantly losing, but that's different than being a loser. Those are two different things. Yeah. And in that sense, you can consider him like the, the everyday person, especially if you're coming at peanuts and life. From the the viewpoint that the the general common thread in the human condition is not like winning and feeling happy, but feeling dissatisfied and losing pretty frequently. That that's the thing yeah. that all of us are equally accustomed to. Um, and Charlie Brown exemplifies that more than anybody. Although, if you really look at Peanuts, pretty much every character, with the exception of maybe Woodstock and Snoopy, more often than not, did not get what they wanted. They they didn't win. They didn't get a good grade. They had trouble understanding things. Like if you look at Peppermint Patty, she was good at sports, terrible at school. And there were plenty of panels that had her not understanding what the teacher was saying or what she was even saying. Marcy, her friend, really good at school, terrible um, socially. She was very awkward. I think Charles Schultz described her as a very strange little girl. Um, so none of them were just like we're we're just like one dimensionally um happy or 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 winning in any way shape or form that's just not how peanuts was or just one dimensional no and that's the other thing first there were plenty of like background stock characters for sure that weren't fully fleshed out but the main characters that we're talking about they were multi-dimensional for sure yeah for sure um so back to charlie brown he was bald which i always thought was very strange yeah. Uh, he had that big uh, moon head and that little squiggle of hair up front mm -hmm. that, as a kid, I re even remember thinking, like, what is going on with this kid? Right. <laughs> I'll never understand it. Um, apparently, he patterned that after, uh, after his own, uh, quote, bland face that he had when he was a baby. So that's Charlie Brown. Um, Lucy Van Pelt mm -hmm. is probably, I mean, I would call her the second lead, probably. Okay. Wouldn't you? I don't know. There's Snoopy somehow in the mix there, and but I don't know if he'd be second lead, lead first. Lead. He's just like almost on his own trip. Off uh, yeah, side. I think Snoopy is almost his own thing. It was okay. almost like a spinoff within a cartoon. Weird. 
Um, but Lucy had black hair. Uh, again, she had that blue dress for many, many years. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was born, uh, or at least born in the comic, on March 3rd, 1952. Mm-hmm. And she was a toddler at first, but she quickly grew up. He didn't, um, I think he realized that there wasn't uh, as many dimensions uh, with a toddler character. Right. Uh, she was kind of annoying and just crying and stuff. So by 53, like just a year later, she was the the wonderful fuss budget we all know as as Lucy, and um, this is a good example of a character being different, like through adult eyes. Uh, when I was a kid, I was like, "Lucy is really mean." She's a pos. She is. She's a real jerk. She's super vain. She's always asking people how she looks, and if they don't say she's pretty enough, she gets really upset. Uh, but now that I'm a, an adult, I look at Lucy and I realize that Lucy is a young girl who is deeply insecure. Mm-hmm. And who has no idea how to express her emotions in a productive way. Right. And these are like adult things that you realize once you get to be an adult. But Lucy was was mean. She was really, really mean to Linus. You just made me insecure, Chuck, because I was thinking how compassionate of you that is. But apparently that's just the grown up view of Lucy, which I haven't attained yet. <laughs> he still thinks she's a jerk. I think she's awful, yeah. But well, maybe it helps I, my, having an eight-year-old daughter, too, and seeing sure. insecurities and stuff sure. like that. Yeah, know. but everything you just said are all the reasons why Lucy is the last character in the Peanuts universe who should put out a shingle um, for psychiatric help. Right. And, and <laughs> instead of a lemonade stand, <laughs> offer psychiatric help to anybody for five cents. Um, and that's what a great bit. Yeah, it is. It is a wonderful bit in and of itself. And then also, it's a great bit in that even though um, she's terrible at it and she has her own insecurities and is just an awful person in a lot of ways, at least on the surface herself, she's also maybe the one that's in the best position to give out psychological advice. Not with any kind of spoonful of sugar, but telling she's a things. Sociopath. Yeah, telling things <laughs> as it is. And like not not giving you a sugar coated version of reality, but saying like, you need to just do this. Yeah, for sure. Um one of my favorite panels that I was uh, or strips that I was kind of looking through over the last few days was uh because Schultz has talked about every character has their own weakness mm-hmm. and he said hers is Schroeder. Yeah. Um she could be sentimental with him. And there was one panel where she asked him why he never gave her flowers. And he said, because I don't like you. And she said, well, the flowers wouldn't care. <laughs> oh. So she had her moments. Like, she was super mean to Linus. She would, one of the running bits was trying to um, get rid of his his little whoopee, his security blanket. Mm-hmm. Like, she buried it. She burned it. She cut it up into little pieces. Uh, in one storyline, she made it into a kite and let go of it, and it flew all over the world, and the Air Force rescued it over the ocean Nice. and brought it back. So she was really mean to Linus, but there was one comic where she said um, she demanded to know from Linus what she has to be grateful for, and he said, you have a brother who loves you, and she busts out crying and hugs him. Yeah, that's very sweet. So again, it's a little girl who's just insecure and doesn't know how to deal with emotion. Okay, all right, fine, fine. She's great. <laughs> Love Lucy. Um, about Schroeder, though, one of the, so Schroeder's the kid with the piano yeah. who plays Beethoven, worships the Beethoven. Virtuoso. Um, if you look at the ones where he's playing the piano, in those panels, there is um, m- like musical scales and notes, like instead of dialogue bubbles at the top of the panel, right? Yeah. Those were all hand-drawn and hand-lettered by Charles Schultz. He he found it very tedious but important because they were accurate. Um, they were they were accurate transcriptions of snatches of Beethoven's music. So if you know how to play the piano and you um, looked at that Peanuts comic, you could play what Schroeder was playing at that time. Amazing! Isn't that amazing? That's serious accuracy. Uh, all right. Hey, listen, I got something to pitch. What? This thing is going to be way long. Yay. So I say we make this a two-parter. Let's take a break. Okay. And then maybe come back and talk about Linus and Snoopy. I say we save Snoopy for part two. All right. We'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll talk a little bit about Linus. And then I'm sorry, everyone. This is just too robust. We're going to make this a two-parter. So we'll be right back. Stuff you 
Okay, Chuck, we're back. We were talking about Lucy. You said she was super mean to Linus. And uh, I would say that's in part because Linus was Lucy's little brother. Is Lucy's yeah. little brother. I don't know why I'm talking about them in past tense. They're still very much alive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. I, I mean, it, it nails like so many sibling dynamics, I think. Um, while there are older sisters who are very caring and loving for their youngers, mm -hmm. there are some who are <laughs> in older siblings, period, who like did not want that baby around. And from the beginning, Lucy didn't want a little brother. And in fact, when Sally Brown came along, Charlie's little sister, Lucy was very jealous because she said that she wanted a little sister. Oh, yeah. And I'm just like, poor Linus, poor guy. Yeah, well, poor Rerun, too. They they both had a, a younger brother, even younger than Linus, named Rerun. Yeah, I wasn't around for Rerun. When did he come around? I don't know. I wish you hadn't asked me that. But he was around for a while. Okay. I, I think that <laughs> was maybe after I stopped reading the comic. So let's talk about Linus for a second because um, – a lot of people consider him a, a, some sort of genius or at least precociously intelligent. For sure. Um, one of the reasons why is because he, he frequently cites philosophers. He's just clearly well-read. He loves school. Um, his teacher, Miss Othmar, he's quoted as saying that she's a gem among gems, and he can't imagine that she would ever accept money for teaching because she's just such a purist and, and so— talented at, at being a teacher. <laughs> like what kid says that? Right. Um, so, yeah. And at the same time, though, um, one of the contradictions in terms of Linus is that he also is far and away the firmest believer in the Great Pumpkin. Yeah. And there's a really great um, strip with him writing a letter to the Great Pumpkin asking him to bring him some toys. And then at the end of the letter, he says, um, and by the way, if you're not real, don't tell me because I don't want to know. Yeah. Yeah, it is very sweet that this kid who talks about philosophy and, like, the high arts is a believer in the Great Pumpkin and also very uh, sensitive. He's he's easily the most sensitive, like, kind of purest character in the Peanuts catalog, I think. Yeah. Uh, he's He's got that security blanket. And apparently Charles Schultz, um, if he didn't coin that term security blanket, he, he made it what it was and popularized it as such, as a— as something a child will have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which yeah. is pretty amazing. Yeah, so the original security blanket was an actual blanket that you pinned to the crib or the bed so that your kid couldn't move. Yeah, it's called super dangerous. <laughs> yeah, and also like torture, I think is another word for it. Um, and then the the military and defense sector picked it up and used it as a metaphor for the the measures and links you went to to keep state secrets secret. But it was Charles Schultz who was like, no, this has, has to do with angst and anxiety. And yeah. um, that's, that's, it was Linus who spread the gospel to the world about security blankets. Yeah, I called it a whoopee earlier, and that is stolen directly from Mr. Mom. Oh, yeah. Who, who I think originated that term. Yeah, whoopee's a great, great word for it, too. Yeah, or binky. I'm not sure who, who made that one up, but binky's a big one. I don't either. I can't even hazard a guess, but I've heard that one, too, before. Um, Did you have blankie? a blankie? I had a blankie. You had a blankie? Yes. Man, that thing was tattered by the time I gave that up. Yeah, I had a pillow. I don't remember if I had a name for it, but it was this little, kind of like a hand pillow, if that's a thing. It wasn't like a full-size pillow. Mm -hmm. And I would, uh, oh, man, this is just coming back to me. I would rub it between my fingers, like over the finger and then down the little valley between the fingers over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And I would also stick it in my ear. And I remember this was a white pillow, and this thing was so disgusting <laughs> by the time I got rid of it from, like, earwax and finger gook mm -hmm. that, uh, I don't mean, my mom certainly would have never said, like, it's time for that to leave. Right. But it may have just, you know, disappeared. I don't remember. <laughs> it went to go live on a farm? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. Yeah, with my goat. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> um, what else you got? Well, nothing. I mean, that's all I got on Linus. I think that's a good, robust part one. I think so, too. So let's start part two in a minute, okay? Sure. Uh, reminder to everyone to go out and uh, get tickets for our live show this year. Yeah. There won't be any listener mail, so we'll just throw in a live show uh, tour plug. How about that? Yeah, so go to stuffyoushouldknow.com or linktree slash SYSK, and you can get info and tickets. Uh, yeah, that's a great idea, Chuck. Yeah, so don't wrap up an email and spank it on the bottom yet. you got to no, wait, right? Not yet. 
Here's the awkward, um, non-clapping transition for a very special two-parter. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.